the first image is of uh, a plate of Stacey Abrams, who is um, an American politician, if you don't know her. Um, she was she was in the running for VP for Biden, but um, uh, I'm excited about Harris, and <laughs> but I would have been extremely excited about Stacey Abrams. Um, she is she ran for governor of Georgia in 2018, which was the year that I moved to Georgia. Um, and it was, um, I sort of had the chance to watch the debates and really um, grew to appreciate her as, an, as a politician um, and as a, a woman and as an activist. And um, I, when the, um, when you emailed us about the opportunity for the show, she was one of the first people that I thought of just because she is, um, really still fight. she she's fighting for um, voting rights very actively right now she has an organization called fair fight action um, which is to um, work against voter suppression which is a big problem in a lot of states and in particularly in Georgia which it um, during her governor race she um, there was sort of like this I don't know if everybody has followed it but there was um, the person she was running against, Kemp, was in charge of. Um, he was kept. He was in charge throughout the race of uh, voter registration and elections in the state while he was running for a major office, um, and he did purge a lot of people's voter registration. Um, so it was kind of like a big. It was really eye opening. It was eye opening for me, just like to see how much of a problem this was. And um, I find her really inspiring that she, she did lose that race and that she immediately sort of switched gears and started this fight against um, voter suppression um, in Georgia but, and across the country. Um, I also really just, I, I felt really passionate about her race that she ran and um, issues that she um, is passionate about and um, I also just really, I think that it's fascinating that she is a, um, a, an author. She writes, she wrote romantic novels that were like pretty um, well received. And I just think that like having that side to a politician that has like this creative side was really interesting. And I um, it was sort of like another reason why I just like felt like, oh, she's just like, just seems like a really wonderful human being. And um, I hope that she is at the forefront of American politics for a long time. Um, and then I guess my other, if you want to go to my other plate, um, which is, I had a hard time choosing a second person for this. And I think my initial, like one of my gut reactions was to do a family member. Um, a lot of my sculptural work is sort of comes from um, this like family history and I've made pieces about my, um, a lot of the women in my family. And um, so this is my grandmother, Florence Bercaglia. Um, she was born in 1926 in Bellevue, New Jersey. Um, and I chose her because um, she was sort of this woman who influenced, who had a huge influence on my life. And um, she was always just like, this like kind positive energy um, in my family and she um, she was just even like she passed away last year and I think like looking back and thinking about like what kind of woman she was she was just always generous and welcoming and um, just like the sweetest person and I just feel like the this was another opportunity for me to kind of honor her. Um, she, that's me and her. <laughs> I really liked airplanes when I was little. Um, so they would take me to, to um, look at airplanes. <laughs> um, but she, um, she grew up in a time, she was a child during the Great Depression and um, she was always just like this just like fiery woman who, you know, didn't take any shit from anybody. and. Um, she worked really hard her whole life and um, she could cook some amazing meals and I just felt like she was somebody that I really 
admire and wanted to kind of commemorate. Um, she, I put zinnias on the back of her. I didn't really think about like the flowers on the back of Stacey Abrams, maybe just, I think I chose like roses that were like the wild roses that I see a lot when I'm hiking around in Georgia. But um, my grandmother was like an amazing gardener and I strive for her garden. <laughs> And I um, haven't really had much of an opportunity to plant the way that I would like to, moving around a lot. But this summer I tried to plant zinnias um, and they were the weakest zinnias I have ever seen. <laughs> like so small and drunken and, um, but I just remember her zinnias in her garden just being these like enormous like swollen flowers that were just like full of color and she would cut them and put them in the kitchen. And um, so I chose sort of a specific kind of like a uh, flower for the back of her plate. Um, and then I guess just my other sort of, I think the next couple of images are just of my sculptural work, um, which is usually mixed media. Um, this is a piece that is, um, of, it's an image of my grandmother and her sister, and then it's embroidered with my hair and my sister's hair. Um, it was sort of, so this is sort of like, um, that I, I sort of have used like this sort of like family lineage in my work a bit. And um, just that my DNA and my sister's DNA is like connected through our hair and things like into um, through my family. And that like, there's something of my hair that is of my grandmother's hair. And um, so I chose these photographs that were sort of like um, images of her as a child or a young adult. and. Um, printed them on fabric using um, like a photo transfer method and then um, embroidered back in with my own hair, my sister's hair, to try and fill in sort of like an area of the photo that I wanted to like remember the story that was sort of something that she would tell us of the, of the um, when looking at images with her. So this is a picture of her and her little sister sitting on a stoop and um, I embroidered back in the, the family dog that was um, sort of her. She always like spoke really fondly of this one dog that they had. And um, so that was sort of like me using my a material for myself to like kind of connect our stories. And then the next image is of um, another sculptural piece that I've I made that was um, about my paternal grandma, grandmother. Um, she is, uh, her name was Linda Jo, and she um, also was an avid gardener. And um, she, um, she lived a kind of like, I think, I feel like her whole life, she lived kind of like a backseat to everybody, took a backseat to everybody else. Um, and when she passed away, I sort of like, felt like we all, our whole family kind of like realized how crushing it was to not have her anymore. And um, I think I sort of wanted to like honor her in some sort of way. So I built this like six foot long <laughs> coffin out of clay and um, decided to make it into this like memoriam for her kind of. And so those are her dentures in there and then flowers from her garden that are like hydrangeas. She always had like amazing hydrangeas in her front yard. Um, so again, sort of like honoring, honoring women is something that I really um, I think a lot about in my own work, in my social work, and um, it was a nice opportunity to use the pottery that um, I've been doing to kind of insert that in, to some, in a different way. So yeah. thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thanks, Grace. Um, that's, that's an amazing piece. Where is it now? <laughs> it's, it seems like it'd be hard to store. It is. Oh, that's just a coffin. Don't worry. Yeah, it was on my front porch for a while, <laughs> um, and right now it's in a show. It's actually in a show at Elon University. Oh, um, where I was last year. So I, I, I took the opportunity to get it off my porch for a few months and <laughs> it's great. It better. <laughs> well, and I can uh, I can really relate to um, that picture of your grandmother. She, I have an Italian grandmother too, and she looked a lot like that. <laughs> great little gardening and. Probably a good cook too. Classy little woman. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much for sharing that with us, Grace. It's it's so meaningful to be able to have these conversations, which which really turn into pretty intimate family stories and and 
what we're each inspired by really tells a lot about ourselves. So thank you for sharing with us. Um, so I think we will, oops. My computer is not, nope, don't do that, okay. My computer is not cooperating with me very well today. I think we'll um, ask Mimi to go next because she looks like she's got her stable internet there. So um, is that okay, Mimi? Are we good? No, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Mimi. Mimi Logopetis is a ceramic artist living and working in Cedar Grove, North Carolina. She grew up in New Jersey, lived in DC, and earned her BFA at Tyler School of Art, where she was summa cum laude and studied with Robert Winokur and Nick Cripple and John Clark. And I think we all know that um, we lost Robert in the spring and um, Nick passed away, I think three years ago, just around this time of year. Um, her work is exclusively porcelain, high fired in a gas kiln, decorated with her proprietary image transfer technique, which we'll see a little bit of. The work is functional, sculptural, or both, focusing on surface imagery, storytelling, playing with translucency, light, and dark. She works on commission and with special collaborations. Mimi's work can be seen in various galleries nationwide, the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. The Ogden Museum in New Orleans, Green Hill in Greensboro, um, Panchuto Restaurant in Hillsboro, North Carolina, the Durham Hotel and Scram Furniture Company. Very exciting. Thank you, Mimi. Take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to talk about my, well, I'll talk about this one first. That's fine. <laughs> I can go back, whatever you want. Yeah. No, no, this is fine. I just wrote some stuff down because otherwise I get completely off track. So I'm just going to keep this really, I, I apologize if it just really sounds like I'm reading, but I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, Angela Davis is a badass and I love her. I have admired her since I was little and first saw her face in the news. She has it. That charisma, that fearlessness, and the dedication to a cause that makes people, even a small child in the New Jersey suburbs, not question her authority. Most importantly, for most people, and as a woman, she has the looks to pull it all off. Unfortunately, that is a thing, and her hair became as iconic as the Black Panther movement itself. The Afro pic that's pictured here, I, and I was supposed to have it in my hand, but I forgot to get it. The Afro pic pictured here, um, I found in my yard here in North Carolina like 20 years ago. I was so excited to find it, I scrubbed it off and it has been displayed in a place of honor in my bathroom on a prominent ledge, never to be budged. I have always wondered how it came to be here. Who left it here? I live on an old tobacco farm. I renovated a farmhouse built in 1881. Who was here? I know much of the owner's histories and I still am fascinated by how a black power fist Afro pick came to be buried in the dirt here. The quote I printed on this platter is so simple, it is amazing to me. Absolutely, I am sick of it all, sick of all political goings on right now. And so acceptance has been a big theme. And so how about not accepting? How about action, change? I love this sentiment. So that's my Angela Davis honorary platter. And I, you know, I've been working a lot with hollow forms. And so this, this form is really kind of reminiscent of um, uh, really classic African pottery at that really geometric almost space age kind of like uh, UFO looking stuff <laughs> so that's that's her nice thank you yeah uh, and then my Louise Bourgeois um, she's one of my most influential artists in my in my sphere um, I thought I'd originally make something similar to my usual work highly decorated full surface printed printed layered pat pattern and imagery maximalist maybe even essentially functional. But then I just was not feeling it. My mood lately has been more minimalist, simple, and more sculptural. When I started looking at some of Louise's other sculptures, things I had not seen before, her marble carved ear really stood out for me. You wanna show that? Yeah. Um, it seemed to say everything in this time, in this show's core sentiment that really resonated with me. As women are usually the ones who listen in society, in family, it also made it apparent that we are the ones who have always needed and must still demand to be heard. Last year, I was so lucky to be able to go back to Greece to see all that beautiful marble, those folds, the drapery, those fallen columns, and I started listening to books of Greek myth, and it has all been influencing my work. 
Porcelain in its unglazed state reminds me so much of marble. So I also connected the dots that Louise's parents repaired tapestries in their shop in Paris as she grew up. I built my platter with thin slabs of porcelain draped, cinched, and darted like fabric. Her sensibility is similar to mine. She was highly emotional, angry, distrustful, and disappointed in adults around her. She felt betrayed, but she used all that to communicate her deep understanding and welcome the discussion of pain and sorrow openly and honestly. I had the honor of meeting her and spending an amazing day with her in her apartment in Chelsea. We cried, she listened to me, she made everyone be quiet so that they could listen to me as well as she asked them to teach everyone about her transfer, how her transferware was fabricated. That's why her platter says, now we listen on the side. <laughs> oh, that's so great, what a great story. She was so cute. Um, and then I think we have some other pieces. So as you can see, we've got the, there's a, on the left, there's a commissioned lamp that I made for a client honoring New Orleans. So it just has imagery of New Orleans and it's made in the shape of a pyramid, uh, mainly because I know Nicolas Cage has, has, has a <laughs> mausoleum made for himself in the shape of a pyramid in the St. Louis Cemetery, which cracks me up no end. <laughs> so that's my New Orleans shape. Uh, and then the platter on the, on the bottom right is kind of a very typical uh, example of my work, my functional work. And then the top is where I've kind of been going lately, where I've been talking about more sculptural and minimal and just perforations, uh, hollowed forms. Um, so very different. I, I kind of straddle. This is, that's where my aesthetic is, like all the way over here or all the way over here. All or nothing. All or nothing. That's right. <laughs> Black and white. So yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. That's pretty much all I have to say. No, that's beautiful. Um, I think we'll, I do have some questions, but I think we'll save them to the end and we'll just okay. go for everybody. Um, Great. Unless, <clears throat> if anyone, yeah. Because then we get to just go through and talk at the end. Thanks so much, Mimi. That was okay. great. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, <clears throat> Julia Galloway is a utilitarian potter and professor. She earned her BFA at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred and then Massachusetts Coll College of Art as a post back student. Julia earned her MFA at University of Colorado Boulder for her MFA, oops, that was twice, and was a visiting scholar <clears throat> at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design to study contemporary crafts and the history of pottery. Julia has traveled through the US, Canada, Japan, Italy, and Turkey. She's been an artist in residence at the Anderson Ranch, Archie Bray, and she was a ceramic or professor and then chair of the School for American Crafts at Rochester Institute of Technology. She lived in Western New York for nine years, and in 2009, she moved to Montana, where she was the director of the School of Art for five years and rotated into full-time teaching in 2014. Julia lives in Missoula, making pottery in her home studio and teaching ceramics, professional practices, and pedagogy at the University of Montana. Julia has exhibited and has work in collections across the United States, Canada, and Asia. And um, she served on the board of Haystack. Archie Bray, she's the director at large at Ensica, and her work has been published in Ceramics Monthly, Studio Potter, Art and Perception, Clay Times, and probably many, many other places. We're so honored that all four of you are joining us today. Thank you so much, Julia. I know you're in between classes, so extra kudos to you for making mm -hmm. time for us. Oh. Hey there, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so happy to be here. I can see my classroom above my computer, and they're doing great. <laughs> they do have a work day, so that's lucky. I can see that their hands are moving. You know, teaching in the time of COVID is um, complicated, though uh, we're all so happy to be back in the classroom. So it's just, uh, we're all just six feet apart, you know? And, um, and you know what? I think students are finally wearing masks. I think that, you know, masks for dust, masks for COVID, it's good. It's good. We're making progress. Hey, I'm so happy to be in the show, and I just love Roberta and Mimi and Grace's work. I mean, holy moly, it's just so beautiful. And these gals can draw, let me tell you, I'm a little jealous. But uh, I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> uh, who I selected for this project. And the first one was this gal, Rachel Carson. 
she wrote a book. She's a early environmentalist, sort of before the term existed. And uh, she wrote this book called The Silent Spring. And it was about how DDT was contaminating uh, the uh, rivers in our country. And this was a, a very long time ago that she wrote this book. And um, and she wasn't she wasn't setting out to be a big environmentalist. She just noticed this problem that all of the eggshells for the uh, birds, for the eagles, were very soft. And so the eggshells weren't, the chicks were hatching too soon before they were ready because the shells were soft and it was due to the DDT in the water. And she noticed that. So she wrote this fabulous book. And that is an image of her looking in her microscope. And uh, anyways, JFK read this book called The Silent Spring, and he told Nixon about it. Nixon read it, and it was one of the reasons why the Clean Water Act was passed. So I selected her as one of my uh, mentors because it seemed amazing to me that one person, a little bit inadvertently, not really, she really wanted to do this, but made such a humongous difference in the quality of our lives. You know, when Silent Spring came out, it was during Love Canal, and it was when like Erie was on fire because of the water quality. And I'm so happy that we've made some progress. We've actually made some progress. So, I mean, in other areas, not so much, but uh, I really wanted to honor her, this quiet scientist taking notes in her little notepad, in her little skirt. And uh, I, I was really taken by her that one person could make a big difference. Wow, you have to remember that. Yeah. Um, I recently, about um, three years ago, started working on this project called the Endangered Species Project. And, you know, I'm <clears throat> trained as a functional potter and I've been making utilitarian pots for a long time. And um, I wanted to do something much bigger than me. And I wanted to um, sort of push the boundaries of what I was involved with and be involved with the world outside of the domestic setting. And uh, so I started making these urns for the endangered species in the United States. Hmm. And so I see them as completely functional in the way that you could potentially put ashes in them. That wasn't the plan. This is urn as metaphor. But the function of them really is educational. And my plan is to show all 1,400 of them together <clears throat> in one show. And it was a little bit hard to shift from uh, making work that was really about homage of the home, of multiples of women's work, of um, uh, lifting up domesticity as an important content in our society, um, to sort of shift to this other thing. But I just was feeling that I wanted to do work that was larger than myself and that I was very passionate about something which is generally unseen becoming seen is when we can make a change. So endangered species are the least seen things. Mm -hmm. And so I started working on these, uh, these urns. Uh, next. So the other person I selected to uh, make a plate for was um, uh, Toni Morrison. Because uh, these two women, many women, but these two women are like the motorboats in front of me and I'm swimming in their wake, right? Like they did something amazing and made room for me. And Toni Morrison's writing is so touching to me that when I read a book, as I, as I get past the halfway point, I have to read slower and slower and sometimes only one paragraph a day so I can stretch that book out as long as possible. And you know, she said um, in an interview, she said, you know, we only have 26 letters. And it seems so amazing to me that she could be so profound in only 26 letters. And uh, I loved that sort of essence you know, the essence of it. And with this plate with her, I have a lovely quote about um, that uh, books are a form of political action. So I carved her on there. And then I just wanted to put gold all around her because I think she's so precious, so precious to me. And, um, and I think that she <clears throat> would often talk about politics in a finer way. You know, the word politics is getting a really bad rap. It's getting a bad rap when really I think that politics is a place where people can come together and talk to each other and raise the level of discourse. That's the potential of what politics can be. And I feel like she always sort of nailed that when she talked about politics in the finest sense of the word. Next. Yeah. And the Greek root. Talk about that later. Speaking of Greek. Uh, these are a little bit some older pots, but I think they both have a an important place in my history of being a potter. In the picture, is uh, my house with my dog, that's my living room. And my work has always been involved in where I live. And uh, so this 
whether it be in this living room, and that's a painting that my grandfather painted on the wall in the living room. So whether it be in the living room or um, the uh, plate is from uh, Endangered Species of Pennsylvania. And then I went on to do Endangered Species of New England. And so I think that my, uh, I like to work about my surroundings because I feel like regionalism is where it's at. That we do have some power in um, the own area, our own area around us to make a difference. And if I can show you something that's regional and personal to me, that you can understand something which is regional and personal to you. So that's really the, the root of this work, though I, I'm so happy to see that picture. I forgot how much I liked it. And uh, so that's, thank you very much for putting that up. Yeah. So those were the pots that I selected, the, the women, the women that I selected. And um, I, uh, I thought very much of doing my mom because she was an early feminist and helped write that book, Our Bodies Ourselves. And um, oh, we, she marched. That's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> She marched uh, in the early um, uh, uh, busing race riots in Boston. She marched in the, with those and we had to go with her as little people. And uh, I, I appreciate that she did what she could, but I, I wanted to also just um, talk about women that really influenced me uh, in my field very much. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, we, I've heard from other people that they might be inspired to keep making plates about women. So maybe you can just do your mom next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I love that, that picture. I'm so interested to hear that that's a painting because I always just thought it was a window. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, sort of both, right? Yeah, that's true. And that idea of, you know, you really did start with what's around you in your house and then you, you're sort of um, widening that circle and, connecting that idea of the word politics to the local because doesn't poly mean city in latin greek Mimi? i don't know why yeah 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 so i don't know maybe we can talk about that at the end thank you thanks so much thanks julia ah, okay and now as i um as i told roberta since my last name starts with a zw i i think being last is pretty cool <laughs> um, and we're so honored that Roberta Griffith is joining us today. Also, Roberta Griffith earned her BFA in 1960 from Chouinard, did I say it right? <laughs> Art Institute, her MFA in 1962 from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale and um, is an award-winning artist and educator exhibiting art nationally and internationally in 33 solo shows, 270 invitational and juried shows. She's, her work is in major museums, national and international. Um, her public and private collection list is also extremely extensive. She is North American correspondent for Ceramica Magazine from Madrid, a member of the International Academy of Ceramics, a professor emerita of art and um, Ampersand Art History Hartwick College 2008 and a re recipient of the National Association of Daughters of the American Revolution American Heritage Award for Women in the Arts. Um, her public collections that where her artwork is included is include the American Ceramic um, Museum of Art. I'm sorry, the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Pomona, Pomona California, and we're sending good wishes to them right now. Arizona State University Art Museum in um, Tempe, Everson Museum of Art in Syracuse, First Albany Corporation, um, the Dom Museum of Contemporary Art in Missouri, and the Hawaii State Art Museum in Honolulu, among many others. Um, and I don't need to talk any more about Roberta's background because she has so many amazing stories that I am really grateful to have heard over the last few months. And I'm just going to scoop her and tell you that she's writing a memoir, so we all get to read about it um, soon. <laughs> okay, Roberta, here you go. Oh gosh, I don't know where to start. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with uh, my two plates because I went back to my roots, and then I'm gonna tell a little bit about myself. And I've kind of just stuck to the ceramics. Um, so I chose as my first. Uh, oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored to be in this show with everyone. It's it, it's just really exciting. I'm so psyched. Anyhow, um, my mom was born in 1912, and she was just Jane Griffith Elliot, 
And she was inspirational in every way as a mom, a full-time working woman, a trailblazing licensed psychologist in the state of Michigan. She was one of the first 100. She accomplished huge amounts of community service with her philosophy of, I'm going to do my good works while I'm here. <laughs> and uh, uh, she had an incredible sense of adventure, which really influenced me. I, I traveled around the world with my backpack for four months and so on when I was 65. But anyway, she grew up in a farm family of six in the middle. And uh, she put herself through school with uh, part-time jobs at Hillsdale College. She was fourth generation in her family to go to college. And, and then she, um, when she, she graduated from high school at 16. So when she was 20, she drove a car for pay to New Mexico from Hillsdale, Michigan. And uh, with that money, she enrolled in graduate school at the University of Albuquerque to get her master's in psychology. I mean, uh, it was just astounding, her sense of adventure. And, it, it, um, and so that was all during the depression. And then she um, got her degree and um, met my dad there and they got married and then they came back east. And uh, after she graduated, my mom could do anything. She could type 100 words a minute, take dictation at 120 words a minute. And just, uh, she was a fully qualified commercial teacher from her part-time jobs and all the things she, she taught in public schools and night school. And she typed wonderful letters to me and to everybody because she could just whack them out so fast. And, uh, and my entire life, she used to write me a letter every week for two years when I lived in Spain on my Fulbright. And um, she taught typing and shorthand while she established herself as a clinical psychologist or a school psychologist and set up psychology departments in several public school districts, as well as um, testing for the state of Michigan all the time and, and different projects and counseling those in need, especially children. And eventually she established her own counseling center in uh, Detroit, Michigan, uh, the South Park Counseling Center, and uh, just did all these community service things as a licensed consulting psychologist. She even helped found, uh, do the state of Michigan program before they had the handicap program for kids. She put a whole school on with pro bono testing in Battle Creek, Michigan. It was just astounding. And then despite her jobs, she always did mom things. She had um, cookies when you could take them to school for, for all the special days, cookie press, Christmas trees, and hearts for Valentine's Day and birthdays. She had great Halloween parties for um, Halloweens for the whole neighborhood. And one time, she, two couple years, she took my whole elementary class in grade school to uh, her school at, at her junior high school in Battle Creek, Michigan, where they had a swimming pool and we had whole class birthday parties. And it was just astounding. And she could sew. She could sew like a bandit. She sewed my ballet tutu when I was four years old. And she sewed my formals as a teenager and my prom dress when I was a senior on our treadle sewing machine. And that's what I learned to sew on. And uh, just uh, educational things took priority. She and, and my dad were totally supportive of me in a, as an artist. And uh, when I was in the first grade, uh, my mom and and her best friend picked up my my uh, sort of my cousin and my sister and another and and uh, her her friend's son and they took us out of school during the day to go to Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Circus in in Detroit Olympia Stadium because it was educational and the educational things in life are the things that count the things that money can't buy it, it was just an astounding way to grow up. And my dad was just a steel salesman. She worked as a, his secretary part-time and we had to answer the phone when we were kids. He was a straight 5% commission for two companies out of Detroit. It, it was pretty amazing. Mom loved to travel. We took two unforgettable trips when I, in, in uh, 1952, we went through the entire Southwest on our way to California to visit her brother to every special Indian Pueblo. And I got pieces from the different Pueblos. And uh, we visited Yellowstone, um, Cow's Bed Caverns, the Painted Desert. She was just astounding with her sense of adventure. I don't know if it came from driving the car to New Mexico when she was a kid, but uh, it really influenced my life. 
And uh, then in 1956, the year before, just shortly before my dad died, we, we took the whole summer and went to Mexico for a couple months. The Alcan Highway wasn't even finished, and uh, she kept a bread in the glove box so and she could shoot because she learned how to shoot a gun uh, on the farm growing up. So we felt totally safe, and we just went everywhere, Mexico City, Saltillo, Vista Hermosa, and, and that's when I decided I was going to go to college for two years and then go to San Miguel de Allende for a year, which I did. And I got a scholarship after I got there, but that's another whole story. Anyway, it, it was with just total pleasure that I, I have taken this opportunity to honor my mom. And she was just truly inspirational, not only for myself, but for many whose lives she improved. So I just got back on the wheel. I've been making installations since 1989, little and big, and uh, out of clay. And I went through life as a painter as well. But anyway, so I did freehand drawing and I put her name on. I, I just wanted to make it something really special. So I glazed the plate, high fire. And then took my trailer and just printed her name and drew her picture right on the plate freehand. And uh, that was my mom. And the other person who I found very inspirational is Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day uh, has been uh, really amazing with the charitable acts of kindness throughout her lifetime for the benefit of very poor people. She was an American journalist, a social activist, and uh, an anarchist uh, who, after a very bohemian youth, became a Catholic Christian without in any way abandoning, abandoning her social activism. I, I just found this extraordinary. Overall, she was an American humanitarian and a reformer and a journalist. That's how she earned her money. And so when she um, joined the, the, the church, and then later she became a founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, which joined radical social reform with the Roman Catholic faith, which I found fabs I've always found that fascinating. I'm, I'm Episcopalian. And, and in a movement for social justice and peace. As an excellent journalist, Day eventually started her own newspaper to try to earn money to keep up her charitable good works in New York City. And she founded the Catholic Worker Daily. The first print run was 2,500 newspapers, and it grew to 50,000, which is just, I think, extraordinary accomplishment for a, a, a woman. She had a love life, and she had a children, a daughter, and, and so on, but, but I'm really focusing on her activities for this little um, speech. <laughs> and, and ultimately, she bought a building to um, house the people. She, she started the House of Hospitality with family and, and then friends and it grew and she bought a building and uh, started to feed the poor. And this is how soup kitchens got started. I, I, I think that's just amazing. And there's some like, I can't count how many are in existence today because of what she gave to our society. And she embraced a call oh. to accept personal responsibility. She lived with the philosophy of feed your brother. And there came the soup kitchens in New York City. It was just astounding. Her, um, her atheism turned over to a love of God and embodies so much of what we need now these days, a genuine empathy for other people. Um, to me, she's a model of how to be, she's passed away, but she, she's always served as a model how to be authentic and have integrity in the things we do and how to live your life with authenticity. And actually, I made a note, her, her, her bio um, on Wikipedia is pretty extensive. And they had a, a, a wonderful uh, a, a a biographical movie, Entertaining Angels, the Dorothy Day story, which is on Prime. Uh, Amazon Prime for free right now. And, and it's a full length documentary. And um, then there was another documentary in 2005 called Dorothy Day, Don't Call Me a Saint. Uh, I'm having to read these because I can't remember all that. And then um, it, it's just an honor to celebrate her on my plate and, and to be making pots. I mean, I started out doing ceramics in 57. I, 
live life as a painter. I'll go into a little bit of my history, but I've just stuck to the ceramics. If you want to see my, my paintings and things, you can go to my website, robertagriffith.com. It's pretty simple. But anyway, uh, I, I'm honored to celebrate these two women. I think the show was made for me. <laughs> and I just drew her freehand from her portrait. I grew up in a family and we had those Diana pattern Czech China plates for family Thanksgiving on the left there. Uh, my entire life with the stem goblets and my, my mother's family of six, my uncles, we used to have huge family dinners. My grandmother was a matriarch. And um, I gave that China service to um, Margaret Carney for the dinnerware museum because nobody wanted to wash gold rimmed plates anymore and they can't go in the dishwasher. And then that was the first plate I made when I started ceramics in 1957 with Marie Wu, the red platter, and she kept it. I had trouble giving it to her, but she kept it for the museum uh, or her collection or whatever. She was my first ceramic teacher. And uh, she used to say, um, you didn't know how to be a student and I didn't know how to be a teacher. It was her first year out of Cranbrook teaching at the University of Michigan. And she inspired me also so much that uh, I grafted ceramics onto my painting. I started painting when I was 10 years old with oils. I can't remember when I couldn't draw. And then my dad, and, and I'm just almost done, put my painting, my self-portrait, into the Battle Creek End Choir News uh, uh, Youth Talent Competition. Not only did I win first prize for 10 and under, but I won best of class for 12 and under. And from then on, I was the artist. I put myself through school and painting fellowships in, in, in um, graduate school. Uh, all the way through after my dad died in 56. And then I couldn't get a Fulbright as a lady painter. They, we weren't worth a dime a dozen in 1958 and 60. And that's what I was. I was a painter. Uh, abstract, realistic, you name it. I just like to make art. And I got one in ceramics and the potters were very unhappy with me. But I spent two years in Spain with Artigas and Mido. And then I got, I worked as a ceramic designer for a year. And Somehow I hunkered down into clay, taught, taught it for 42 years, started it at my college and built the department and was chair for 17. I retired in 2008 and I just make art now. I was so excited to be invited to make these plates because it pushed myself to get back on the wheel and, and do my stuff. And I, I could teach students how to throw. I am Myrtle the turtle. I am so slow. I would never make it as a production potter. Um, that's one of my painting and uh, my big charges behind me that I've always had. And that's not my painting, but I, I have a nice collection. And uh, uh, thank you all for listening to me. I mean, this has just been such an adventure, and I, I'm just so honored to be have my 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 plates in in this show. Thank you. Thanks, Roberta. That's so nice, and it's great to see your inspiration plate from your youth and your first ceramic that you ever made. That's amazing. Um, and then we just have, this is a close-up of a plate that's like the one on the wall behind you. That's in the yeah. Everson, yeah. Um, and then you have two of your installations. These are I love this one. I skipped from 57 to uh, mid-career 80s and now this is 2015 with my 25 no plates in the corner at uh, Versailles, or um, I'm sorry, not Versailles, but um, the um, Escorial outside Madrid influenced me where you can echo across the room from corner to corner. So I made an echo with no, not, nope, no, no. It's kind of political underlayments here. I, I do, uh, all, uh, in my statement, I, I, I like things that influence me. I'm from travel and from things that are happening and life and death underlayment of things. It's kind of macabre. And, and uh, actually, that was in the uh, Honolulu Museum of Art as a solo show for my no plates. I think I had about 46 no plates there. I just got so tired of making plates. But I mean, plates have been part of my life from, from my family dinners. So this just kind of was the capstone of my career to do, to do these plates honoring my mom and Dorothy Day and, and see all these other fantastic plates honoring all these women. I mean, when I started teaching, they didn't have maternity leave and I was pregnant. I got that. They didn't have uh, pay for spouses uh, if you weren't the breadwinner for tuition for your kids. And I got that. And I just fought my way through. I was department chair for 17 years and taught school for 42 years. And I loved every minute of it. Hi to any student who's out there. I love you all. I only do Facebook. I don't have a cell phone. And I got my computer. That's it. <laughs> Oh, Roberta, that's, yeah, and you're an inspiration to me and I'm sure everybody else too. So thank you for paving the way 
for us. And as Julia said about her women, you're, you made the wake for the rest of us to follow along. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm just so, as I said earlier, I'm just glad to be alive and I'm working hard to stay alive. <laughs> I guess we're all doing that every day, but we, we're glad you're doing it. So thank you so much. Um, I want to see if anybody has some questions. Um, I'm just going to check in the chat. Doo -doo -doo. Stephanie says, fabulous work. Um, Flo says, just love hearing from each of you beautiful women and seeing your work. Thank you from Flo in New Jersey. Oh, we've got so much New Jersey today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, love that picture, Julia. That's from Raymond. He's our graphic designer and an artist himself. Um, and of course, I could depend on him to look up politics. Thank you, Raymond. Politics, late Middle English from Old French politique, political via Latin from Greek politikos, from politis citizen, from polis city. So that's right. I agree with Julia that we should stop acting like politics is a bad thing. It's how we are, you know, doing our civic duty. And Raymond also says he wants your memoir, Roberta. So do I. <laughs> My son said he's going to make it a bestseller, so I won't have to worry about surviving. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Oh, and Lisa says, if I were going to make a plate to honor an inspirational woman, it would be you, Roberta. So great to be introduced to you. You had me at the backpack trip around the world at age 65. <laughs> oh, that was Lisa Naples. Um, and then Beverly says, we think of politics in a negative way in these times. However, it really is advocating for what we believe in. Yeah. For sure. And all of you are doing that through your artwork, which is a huge inspiration to me. And that's really why I got into this idea of being a curator and studying art, because I, I see it as the representation of what we all believe in and what we're striving for. So it's important and in any time, but we, I think we all know it's important right now. So uh oh, more, more questions. Roberta rocks. That's another comment. <laughs> Michelle says, I loved hearing everyone's stories about their inspiration and um, read that is, oh, um, says Mimi, what's one thing that you take away from Angela Davis's lifestyle that you apply to your life? That's a good question. That's great. Um, Besides eating a pick for your hair. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's getting there. Um, I don't know. I mean, she's such a force. I'm such an isolationist. Uh, I think I try to live by example. I'm a big environmentalist and um, I live off grid. I don't have air conditioning. I live in North Carolina <laughs> where it's wet, humid and horrible. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't even, I don't even begin to compare myself to anything Angela Davis does. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, I guess you just, if you just pick something and stick with it. I mean, she doesn't stop. So I, I hope I don't stop doing whatever it is I believe in and hopefully uh, forming some sort of uh, good model to somebody. But, you know, I'm just not out in the public sphere and that's kind of the way I like it. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I don't know, but I, I do adore her. Well, yeah, even I think that idea that we can't, if you, th you think you can't live up to someone who's an idol, you, even just that you, th you think about what that person does, you know, yeah. you're, you're starting to live up to them just by that. Cause it's humble to, to say it that way. I would love to hear that question. That's a great question. Can we ask um, Grace maybe? And then everybody else, is there something from either your grandmother or Stacey Abrams that is like a characteristic that you hope you represent in your life? And you're on mute still, so <laughs> and it's hard to remember. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, I think from my grandmother, just that she approached everybody with, I think, like a a very she was just like a, a genuinely kind, generous person, and I think that I need I hope that I can embody that. Um, I think she also like she um she knew when to stand up for herself and I think I 
something else I need to work on. <laughs> but you're like, I'm gonna choose me <laughs> a little bit more. Um, she was, she, uh, she didn't take shit, I think. And, um, and Stacey Abrams, I think just, I really like, I think watching her sort of like, like lose that governor's race and then just immediately switch gears and like keep plowing and like plowing forward like in this like other positive way um I think it was a, it was really inspiring and I hope that um that having that sort of like bravery and foresight to like be able to jump full force into something else when the first thing doesn't work out um and try and fix the problems that are um that are hindering the system from working. Um, I think those are sort of the things that I would like to try and take from them. Yeah. Learning how to fail is, um, I think it's a skill that it's hard, it's harder and harder maybe because we're, there are a lot of technology and things in our lives that make it a little bit harder to fail sometimes. And um, never waste a crisis is my favorite saying of the last couple of years. Uh, Cause something, something good's going to come out of that. Anything is if you, if you think of it that way, right. It's perspective. Julia, I don't know if you have to go to your next class. Do you have a minute to tell us your. Uh, I you're... Do want, yeah, I do have to go in one sec. Um, they're setting up now. So I got a second while they're unwrapping their projects, but um, uh, Toni Morrison um, talked about that. She wrote the books that she wanted to read. And I remember reading that quote in graduate school and I thought that <clears throat> I should really make the pots that I wanna use. And I came up through school in a time where there was some pretty um, clear uh, structures of what good pots looked like. And my pots didn't really look like that. They were much sexier and much more sort of feminine. And, um, and I remember when I read that quote from her, I thought, well, I'm gonna make the pots I wanna use, you know, and that that just made room for me to grow. Like uh, when she said that, I had uh, I had just more room around me and uh, more room ahead of me, and that that was uh, really made a huge impact. That's great. Well, thanks so much for joining us in in between your classes. You have very lucky students. And and Roberta, how about from your mom? Do you have that one thing that you hope you embody from her? Oh my God, her integrity and honesty, but I can go back to my grandmother. All, all her kids, except the youngest one, were college graduates. My grandma could spell like a bandit. I, I took her to live with me when I was 19 and she was 79 after my dad died. My mom needed time. He died very unexpectedly from exploratory surgery. And uh, I used to visit her farm almost every summer of my life. It was my R&R. And I have the bell she used to ring as a, a, a itinerant school teacher. And, and, and she was just absolutely incredible person. And my, her, her husband died when I was just a month, couple months after I was born. My other grandmother, my Welch grandmother died when I was four. So I had the one grandmother, but she raised six children and they all were very successful. Uh, it's just, and my mother was kind of in the middle and sort of the glue for the family. It, it was just astounding because of her communication skills and her letter writing. When I went around the world, I think I spent more money on postcards than I did for food. And I would just get them off. But, but I, I, I just have these, these two inspirational women in my life that I, I've traveled and done things with my kids and everything and just tried to pass on the things that were given to me growing up. It was just extraordinary. Um, it, it wasn't the money. It was uh, uh, you were expected to to play it forward and do your share. And I was a concert musician. I had a hard time deciding to be an artist, sort of, because I was a concert flutist. I was first chair at Interlochen and first chair in my high school, but art always won out. I was just always the artist. And I've never sold that much. I have huge storage bills. And I have some things in good museums and I just can't stop making art. It's just terrible. <laughs> Not terrible. Keep making art. We're, we're, ha we're so happy you do. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'm going to just read a couple more. Let's see. Oh, Eva Kwong is with us and she says, wonderful and inspiring work. Thank you, She Rose. Um, <laughs> 
Nancy. It. Thank you. <laughs> Nancy Hayes and, and Leslie Farron are both so kind that um, saying, it's a book in the making. Each week we learn so much about the artists and the women they chose to focus on. And um, Raymond says, there's such a bibliography that comes out of these talks. Yes, I agree. And then Julia said, um, my class is starting. Sadly, I have to go. Thank you for your time and interest. So great to hear from Roberta, Mimi, and Grace. And um, kisses from six feet away. <laughs> Thanks to Julia. Um, well, we are at our time or over our time. I just want to thank everyone again for joining us and sticking with us and hearing all of our wonderful artists and talk about their inspirations. It's, it's the best part of my week. So we'll see you next week, hopefully, um, both for the Lunch and Learn and for the Mud Ball. Don't forget, you can still buy your ticket until tomorrow if you want a swag bag. And there are Jennifer Martin cups in those swag bags. And I know you want one of those. So go right onto our website. And um, Raymond put the web address into the chat. So scroll up to the top and you can click on that. Thanks, okay. Raymond. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Beverly. Nice to see you. Virtual hugs to everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks to Thank each you. of you artists. Thank you. But we have them from all over the country today. That was fun. Even yeah. though they're strong roots in New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Hi, Lisa. Thank you. Raymond's my co-pilot. <laughs> have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.